you, Julia. <laughs> um, I had a lot of fun in the uh, breakout session. Uh, I've never had that kind of like deep and broad questions uh, that challenges me to think. Hopefully, I mean, uh, uh, through the discussion, we uh, learned uh, from each other. Today's topic that was given to me is a topic of a legacy of faithfulness. This is actually uh, the last chapter in uh, Crawford Loritz's uh, book uh, on uh, leadership as identity. Uh, now, again, uh, as uh, uh, Ed Cannon has mentioned earlier, that uh, uh, I mean, I do not speak on this uh, topic because I'm qualified to speak on the legacy of faithfulness. Uh, so uh, in this uh, talk, I am not going to talk about myself at all. So I picked actually two people uh, that I thought, uh, thought as a, uh, a people who actually have the leg legacy of faithfulness. So I wanted to just uh, inspire you by telling the story of these two people. Okay? Uh, let me uh, just read this quote from the Bible. He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. This uh, sentence was a description of which character in the Bible? The, uh, the, the, the uh, hint is in the Old Testament. Can you guess which character? Elijah? Moses? David? Daniel? Abraham? <laughs> okay, we got a lot of uh, good characters. But actually, uh, this is a unique description, right? He was faithful, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. Joseph, yeah, I think Joseph would fit the bill too. But actually, this uh, comes from the uh, uh, book of Daniel, chapter 6. The context of the story is actually a story that we know all very, very well. It's the, lion's, uh, it's the story of Daniel in lion's den, right? Uh, Daniel uh, faithfully uh, adheres to uh, uh, praying to God every day, three times a day, toward Jerusalem. And uh, somehow uh, his uh, uh, co-workers uh, conspired against him. And eventually, actually, it's a story of an uh, amazing miracle. He, goes, he uh, is uh, put into a lion's den. And this picture by uh, a British uh, painter named uh, Britton Revere uh, captures the, imaginatively captures the uh, scene. I mean, this is a very ironic scene. Daniel, even though he's all tied up, stands there defiant in front of these uh, ferocious, hungry lions. Lions, even though they are hungry, ferocious, they, you see uh, they are fearful of Daniel. What an ironic picture. I think actually uh, sort of uh, captures that moment uh, very nicely. Um, and, but when I actually read this story again uh, several years ago, I was surprised, not by this irony, but by another irony in the story. You know, uh, as uh, someone who believes in almighty God, I sort of expect that, I mean, God will save Daniel. God can shut down lion's uh, mouth, right? But actually, uh, as I was reading the story, there is uh, another really interesting irony. It's about how the king Darius reacts to the... Uh, uh, to the accusations that brought against Daniel. So let's go back to the story and read the story a little bit. I mean, you know the story really, really well. The context of the story is that actually these administration high officers, uh, they are jealous of Daniel's excellence and Daniel's uh, continuous promotion. So they come up with this devious plan to, uh, to uh, trap Daniel. So uh, they come with this plan. Long live the King Darius. We are all in agreement. We administrators, official, officials, and high officers, advisors, governors, except Daniel, right? There were 123 people. So 122 people agreed, except Daniel, that the king should make a law that will be strictly enforced. Give orders that for the next 30 days, any person who prays to anyone, divine or human, except to you, your majesty, will be thrown into the dens of lions. And so King Darius signed the law. Actually, if you go back here, if you stay on this. Uh, uh, now, what kind of king would agree to that kind of <laughs> request? Uh, 
you can tell from this story that King Darius definitely was not a godly person, right? He was, uh, in a way, narcissistic person, uh, very self-conscious. Uh, he want, he's uh, arrogant. Uh, in fact, actually, he wanted to uh, throw people into lion's den. He probably was a very violent guy, too. Definitely not a godly guy, right? Uh, so this uh, king signs this. And then... Uh, these uh, administrators, uh, administrators they, they know that Daniel's got, they, I mean, this is their moment. We got Daniel now, right? So Daniel, uh, as they have expected, he still continues to pray. So if you go to, if you go to the next uh, passage here, and they caught Daniel, they come to the king triumphant. They told the king, that man Daniel, one of the captives from Judah, is ignoring you and your law. He still prays to his God three times daily. Now, listen to how King Darius reacts to this. Now, again, I'm, I'm, I want you to be reminded that actually King Darius was not a godly man. Narcissistic, arrogant, vain, uh, and to, to a degree, maybe even violent guy. And as uh, he's listening to the accusations that brought against uh, Daniel, that Daniel actually broke the law that he just signed himself. Now, the normal reaction you'd expect is to be angry. What? He broke my law. He disobeyed my command. That would be the normal reaction that you would expect from a guy like this. But listen to what he did. Hearing this, says the king was deeply troubled and tried to think of a way to save Daniel. And he spent the whole rest of the day looking for a way to get Daniel out of this predicament. Can you imagine, right? This ungodly pagan king trying to save, spends a whole day trying to save this one man who was brought into the country as a captive. And then in the evening, I mean, it was already too late. He couldn't do anything. And then he goes to uh, Daniel. He says in the green letters here, may your God, whom you serve so faithfully, rescue you. And he's the he's the last word that he wanted to impart on Daniel was this. And then a stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den. The king sealed the stone with his own royal seal and the seals of his nobles so that no one could rescue Daniel. Then, the Bible says, the king returned to his palace, spent the night fasting. He didn't eat anything. And he refused his usual entertainment and couldn't sleep at all that night. Isn't that amazing? This king, this narcissistic, ungodly king, spends the night fasting, and then he stays up whole night thinking about Daniel, worrying about Daniel. I mean, they just when I read this story, it just blew me away. What kind of guy was Daniel that would actually cause uh, someone like King Darius to lose sleep over him night and then uh, fast over him? Um, you know, I cannot think of anybody who can, we, I can actually compare King Darius with in today's context. Maybe, I mean, what kind of uh, leader would say, uh, you know, I, you only pray to me 30 days, uh, for 30 days, no, nobody else. Maybe the North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un, right? <laughs> uh, that's probably the closest you can come, up, come to uh, King Darius. But imagine the North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un, actually... Uh, losing sleep over a foreigner that came into his country because he wants, he's worried about him. I mean, that is that kind of context here. Uh, strange, strange story. So why? What was it about Daniel that, uh, that was so special? Um, so if we go to the next slides, I think Crawford, uh, in his book, uh, sums it up really, really well. He says, uh, Daniel was faithful. He was God's man, and his life was marked by gravitas. He was not defined by his times, but in a wonderful sense, his life brought definition to his times. The unbelieving, godless Babylonian empire did not touch him, but instead, he touched it for God, in gravitas. So what, he's try what Crawford is trying to say is that uh, Daniel had this, uh, this uh, weight and substance and this uh, moral superiority, uh, moral integrity in him 
dead, actually nothing. Everybody saw him, and then there was something different in him. Some people were jealous because of that, but some people respected him tremendously. And King Darius, despite of his, uh, his uh, faults, he respected King uh, Daniel tremendously. So if we, uh, if we move to the next slide, uh, and what is about Daniel that I think uh, the King Darius respect him so, uh, um, I mean, uh, so much is that because he was, uh, uh, in Daniel 6, 4, it describes him as a faithful person, always responsible, and completely trustworthy. And the word faithful here, I think, is a really, really interesting word. The faithful uh, here uh, is an Aramaic word uh, that appears only three times in the Bible, all in the book of Daniel's. And the two instances of that word actually appears in the same story, in Daniel chapter 6. Right? So the first instance is chapter, verse 4. He was faithful. And then uh, in 6.24, it says, After Daniel was lifted out of the uh, lion's den, not a scratch was found on him because he had trusted in his God. That can also actually translate as uh, because he was faithful to his God. Does that make sense? Uh, the same word, actually. The, if you look up the definition of uh, faithfulness uh, in the dictionary, it means uh, fidelity, loyalty, or commitment, or devotion to somebody or to something to your belief so commitment in a way is actually uh, the faithfulness in a way is a, a relational word you're always committed to somebody um, so in this story daniel's faithfulness was actually his devotion his a hundred percent commitment to god that's what faithfulness is and that faithfulness that his uh, commitment and devotion to god was expressed in a, I think in very unique ways. We can go to the next slides. And uh, uh, in Daniel chapter 6, verses 1 to 3, you know, these, uh, the other satraps, the other administrators, they're trying to trap Daniel. But he says, then Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and satraps because an excellent spirit was in him. Now, Bible says uh, his faithfulness, his commitment, his devotion to God was expressed in excellence in his work. He distinguished himself. Uh, there were, again, 123 leaders in King Darius's court. But out of them, he distinguished himself through excellence. Now, uh, I think it was yesterday uh, uh, and today Joshua mentioned a little bit about building competence, right? In our life, Christians, uh, we, have to, we have to build character. But we also have to continue to build our competence because I think our competence, excellence, also speaks about our commitment, our faithfulness to God as Daniel's faithfulness did. And the secondly, uh, his faithfulness also was expressed in uprightness. Uh, uh, again, in verse 6-4, he was faithful and no negligence or no corruption was found be, uh, uh, was to be found in him. And in some translation, it says always responsible or completely trans tra trustworthy. But the, actually, the literal translation is no negligence and no corruption. So uh, he was uh, completely faithful or committed to God. And that commitment to God was expressed in how he worked. He was excellent, but at the same time, he, had, he did not neglect his responsibility. There was no negligence at all. And then there were no corruption. Uh, uh, in our uh, breakout session, we talked a lot about corruption. It seems like it's a very important topic in this uh, society. But uh, Daniel completely was devoid of corruption. Right? They tried to find him. I mean, the 120... 120 sets, I'm sure they spend a lot of time digging up the dirt uh, uh, for Daniel. They could not find anything. They could not find anything. I think that's also faithfulness. His faithfulness was expressed through his this, uh, moral uh, uh, uprightness. And the third, uh, he was also a person of integrity. Now, as you know, when uh, the, the law was signed, he still went home, and in his upper room, he knelt down on his knees three times a day 
and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since the early days. Now, when it comes to integrity, I think of integrity this way. Integrity is actually really simply a consistency. It's a consistency between your word and actions. And it's also consistency of your word and action regardless of how the circumstances change. Daniel was consistent. He had integrity. Even though circumstances changed, he did not change his commitment. He did not change his behavior. Now, in fact, actually, this last phrase, as was his custom uh, since early days, you know, if you actually translate that phrase literally, it actually means because that's who he was since early days. Isn't that, isn't that amazing? Uh, Crawford earlier mentioned that uh, it's not really about what we do, but it's really about who we are, identity as leader. And that's exactly what that phrase says. Uh, it's because that's who he was since early days. That's integrity. Now, I told you I'll give you, uh, I think, one more, uh, two examples. So I give you one biblical example. I want to give you another example from uh, uh, early modern uh, business history. Uh, I wanted to introduce to this guy named John Wanamaker. John Wanamaker was the, uh, uh, he was an inventor of uh, department stores uh, in the uh, uh, in United States. In fact, actually, if you read the uh, uh, retail management textbooks or any retail management textbook, even marketing textbooks, uh, he's, also, he's often known as the father of uh, modern department stores, father of modern ad advertising. He was a pioneer in marketing. I mean, you can read about him in like, any uh, b business uh, marketing textbooks. Uh, amazing guy who he started this uh, whole uh, uh, department store industry in the United States. Uh, uh, currently, I mean, his uh, stores are now uh, known as uh, Macy's. Uh, Macy's actually bought the, his uh, John Wanamaker brand uh, many years ago. It all started with his experience of being mistreated by a merchant as a young customer uh, and he was trying to buy a bir burst, uh, birthday gift for his mom, but he was, uh, I mean, very uh, mistreated by the uh, store owner. And as soon as he walked out, he determined that, I mean, when I grow up, I'm going to start someday a store that's going to be different, an uh, honest store that treats uh, his, uh, his customers and employees with respect. So it's uh, so honest that even a blind person can come and without any worry. That's, that's what he said, actually when he came out of the store. And in 1961, and 1861, at the tender age of 22, probably uh, uh, similar to some of you here, right? Uh, he starts his own company. Uh, I know I've, heard, I've met a lot of entrepreneurs here that you started your own company, and uh, you're in the same league as uh, John Wanamaker. So in 19, 1861, he opened the store. And, but when he opened his store, he actually came up with five principles he's going to apply in how he run his organization. And those five principles are, uh, number one, a store should not be a trap to catch something from each who enters it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we laugh, but actually back then, that was the norm. That was the norm. Number two, advertising must say exactly what the store is and what it does. Again, we laugh, but uh, back then, I mean, there were a lot of false advertisement. Uh, they would say, uh, oh, we, ha we just have uh, brand new uh, sweaters. Uh, we're putting them on sale for five bucks. Uh, and customers walk into the store and says, oh, that, store, that sweater, oh, it's sold out at the moment. But we have this one. It's ten, ten, for ten dollars. Would you like to buy? <laughs> that was like a very, very common practice back then, right? Uh, and then number three, all the goods sold are called back again if the buyer is not pleased to retain them. Now, for number three, for we take for granted today, right? So if uh, we're not happy, we return. We get our money back. Most of the uh, good stores, you get money back, right? Uh, uh, <laughs> not in Indonesia? <laughs> no? Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. Oops. <laughs> um, in uh, 
hopefully, I mean, uh, at least in uh, big, big, big stores, uh, you get your money back. Uh, but I, if you ever done that before, have you, has anybody returned something and got money back? Stores? Well, if ever, if you ever done that before, you have John Wanamaker to thank for, because he actually initiated it. Number four, fair prices for everything to everybody alike, without hidden reservation and concessions. Prices always same for everybody. I'm going to talk a little more about that later. Number five, justice and honor require the exclusion of baits or even trifling deceptions. Customer whose confidence is invited and are given are entitled to have their confidence respected and protected at every point. Now, he came up with these five principles at age 22. And when nobody is uh, practicing business this way. And as you can imagine, John Wanamaker's business practice had a tremendous impact in how businesses, retail businesses are run in the United States. All five of these uh, principles are now taken for granted, in, at least in the United States. And we have John, John Wanamaker to thank for. Now, I think that's faithfulness. Faithfulness uh, through moral uprightness. If you go to the next slide, he was also uh, excellent in, uh, and in running of his business. If you can uh, just scroll down all of them. OK, here. So uh, Wanamaker was an innovative retailer. He was excellent in everything he does. He it was the first department store with electrical illumination, first store with a telephone, first store to install pneumatic tubes uh, to transport cash and documents, first store to have these uh, public event uh, hosted in his uh, stores, first restaurant in a general store, first store to send buyers overseas for foreign market. I mean, I only sampled a few of them. There are many, many more firsts that are. Uh, I mean, he uh, was an innovative retailer, constantly uh, thought about better way of uh, serving his customers and serving his employees as well. Uh, in fact, actually, people, if you go to Philadelphia, I've heard people still talk about the Wanamakers, even if <laughs> we have uh, we have an example uh, here. People in Philadelphia still talk about Wanamakers. And they, uh, e uh, that department store is used to be called the Eagles, right? So uh, st people still say, let's go meet at the Eagles. <laughs> uh, meet me at the Eagles. I mean, that's how Wanamaker just uh, changed how people interact, how people uh, uh, shop. Uh, again, faithfulness through excellence. And the next slide, and faithfulness through integrity. Uh, and John Winemaker already mentioned that uh, his advertisements are always truthful. He guaranteed the quality of merchandise in print. Merchandise returned for cash refund, as I mentioned. I mean, he uh, promised, and um, whatever he promised, he delivered, right? And also, fair price. Um, he wanted to maintain generous and proper balance between buyer and seller. Now, uh, John Winemaker's uh, principle is this. I'm not going to arbitrarily set price for everything. What I'm going to do is that whatever I buy, I'll put 6% markup, and then I'll sell it to my customers. Uh, by the way, back then, 6% markup was enough. Today, probably with the cost, rising cost of businesses, 6% markup is probably not even close. But actually, back then, that was enough. So uh, whatever he said, uh, bought, bought, I mean bought, he would put 6% markup and sell them. Now, uh, so imagine this. Uh, he usually, I mean, he buys this kind of shirt let's say for $20, and he'll sell it for $21.20, right? $21 and, uh, no, no, 6% markup is, that's right, $21.20 <laughs> to uh, his customers. That's his normal price. Imagine the, actually, the manufacturer of this shirt uh, said, uh, oh, we actually, this time we actually way overproduce. We need to get rid of the inventory. Now, we're going to give you like half the price. Uh, Ten dollars, but uh, you have to buy everything. Would you buy? And John Wanamaker was okay. We'll buy, right? So ten dollars, right? Now this this shirt usually sells for twenty-one twenty. Now even if he actually sold it for fifteen dollars, he would sell everything. He would sell everything, and customers will be very very happy. But not John Wanamaker. He set that price principle, right? Whatever I buy, I put six percent markup. So he would sell it actually uh, ten sixty. Now. There are actually companies that still follow Wanamaker's principles. And one of the companies is actually uh, Costco. Uh, I don't know if you have Costco in Indonesia, right? Costco does uh, exactly the same thing today. So they, Costco does, uh, uh, I think Costco today does about 14% markup. So whatever they buy, they put 14%. Mm, they, don't they, don't, they don't try to uh, 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 manipulate the price. Again, that 
Again, that principle was uh, initiated by John Wanamaker. And he also institutionalized price tag. Now, price tag is a very interesting concept, right? Uh, uh, I, mean, I haven't done any shopping in Indonesia, so I don't know. But I just actually came from Vietnam, and I went to the market and to buy some gift for my wife. Uh, uh, but in Vietnam, if you go to market, you have to, there is no price tag. So you always have to haggle uh, for price, right? So uh, I bought something, uh, uh, asked, uh, like, how much is it? It's, uh, the, the lady said, uh, it's $25. So I, 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 I know it's, I have to haggle. So I actually, I, I haggled really hard. I bargained really hard, so I bought it for actually $10. I was pretty happy, right? I was pretty happy. So I brought it to the hotel. <laughs> and then the lady uh, who also came from uh, America, she bought the same thing. And she said she bought it for $5. <laughs> 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 um, um, but that just tells you a little bit about, I mean, when you don't have price tag, a clear transparency about price, who pays high price and who pays low price? Right? Someone... Uh, uh, someone, a foreigner like me, will always pay high price, right? Because I just don't know. And also, uh, uh, in Wanamaker's days, uh, he argued that actually, usually uh, people who are rich will pay a better price than people who are poor. Because rich uh, buy in larger quantities, and they make more frequent purchases. So they are more likely to pay better prices than poor who buy in small quantities and, and make very infrequent uh, purchases, right? So uh, what, when he said, is really interesting, he says actually, when I set a price, uh, a standardized price for everything, then everybody pays the same price. And people asked him, so why do you do that? And his answer is actually fascinating. He said actually, we are all equal before God. Why are we not equal before Christ? Why should we not equal before Christ? I thought that answer was just fascinating, right? Uh, so he brings his faith. Uh, and his uh, biblical principles and how he run his organization. Again, faithfulness through integrity. And he brought the same uh, uh, integrity uh, in how he manages his organization. If you can just scroll down all the way to the end. And he was, f uh, when, in, when it was norm in 19th century, it was norm uh, to mistreat the employees. But Wanamaker was amazing in how he manages, how he uh, develops his employees. He looked at his employees as uh, people who are created in God's image. He did his best uh, to uh, uh, offer, uh, to develop them, such as offering classes. And he found this uh, institute to uh, provide uh, better education. Uh, he actually sent them uh, sometimes overseas training. He offered free medical uh, care, recreational facility. I mean, these are, in many of the good companies today, these are already, uh, it, it became a norm, right? Back then, they were not norm. Wanamaker initiated a lot of these uh, practices. We take for granted. Again, if you uh, uh, enjoy these uh, medical care, profit sharing plans, uh, pensions, you have Wanamaker to thank for, right? Again, Faithfulness through integrity. And then uh, if you go to the last uh, slide, uh, John Wanamaker's uh, statue still stands today in front of the uh, Philadelphia City Hall. And if you look at the uh, statue, there is only one word, John Wanamaker, citizen. Nothing else, citizen. In fact, this actually statue was uh, built by uh, uh, citizens of uh, uh, Philadelphia after he passed away. Now, uh, there was no one donor who actually built this. Uh, it was uh, the money for the uh, statue was collected by a number of uh, uh, many, many people who benefited from his uh, generosity. In the city of Philadelphia, there was no corner of city of Philadelphia that was not touched by his generosity, they say. Hospitals, schools, they all benefited uh, from his uh, generosity. So, in fact, actually, that uh, little school kids they like, uh, gave like one cent uh, so that they can remember John Wanamaker. And so they built this uh, statue and they put this one word citizen because that was John Wanamaker's favorite word. Uh, uh, and not because he was a good citizen, he says. Uh, it actually comes from Philippians 3.20. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly wait a savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He lived as citizen of heaven. Uh, so again, I wanted to remind you, uh, faithfulness 
can be expressed in a number of different ways, but we can see, uh, at least in the story of uh, Daniel and Wanamaker, faithfulness can be expressed through uh, excellence, uprightness, and integrity. And when we do that, people around us change. If you see the next, uh, last slide here, you know, when faithfulness is uh, apparent and God is glorified in this process. And look at the ending of the story of Daniel's lion's den. The king Darius sent this message to the people of every race, and nation, and language throughout the world. Peace and prosperity to you. I decree that everyone through our kingdom tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. <laughs> Amazing, isn't it? For he is the living God, and he will endure forever. His kingdom will be, never be destroyed, and his rule will never end. Wow, that's faithfulness with gravitas, right? I hope, uh, I mean, this uh, story of these uh, two incredible characters will inspire to live with faithfulness and leave a legacy of faithfulness as I will strive to do. <laughs> Thank you very much.